make sure we're recording here. There we go. All right. And um, we're going to rock and roll here with a little introduction to eCyberMission. So a little bit about what eCyberMission is. Uh, it's a web-based STEM competition, and it is free to students in grades six, seven, eight, and nine. So students will work in teams. Um, generally, it is teams of three or four, though this year due to uh, the COVID situation that we have going on, uh, we've actually changed it so that, oops, sorry about that, so that teams can actually be uh, two students uh, this year. So that's a, that's a little change that's happening this year um, exclusively. And uh, we have also, the teams normally need to be uh, students who are all in the same grade. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But uh, we, again, have um, changed it up this year uh, because of the situation that um, a lot of teachers are finding themselves in, where we're going to allow teams to be comprised of students from multiple grades, six, seven, eight, or nine. Uh, they don't need to all be in the same grade, but they would be competing in the grade level of the highest grade on the team. So if you had two sixth graders and an eighth grader on a team, uh, that team would be competing against other eighth grade teams. Uh, but if you had two eighth graders and a ninth grader, they'd be competing against ninth grade teams. So whatever the highest grade level on the team is, uh, that's the grade in which the students will compete. Um, and again, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a few moments here. Now, this is a long-term project where they are uh, exploring a problem in their community. So the topic that they choose for their for their project is totally up to them. We don't assign topics. Uh, it's up to them to choose a problem that they would like to explore or try to solve, um, exploring it using science or trying to solve it using engineering. So again, they can choose kind of their path on that. Uh, it's long term. So we're looking at weeks instead of days, uh, possibly even months that they are working on this project because uh, it's a long term type of thing. So because it's a competition, though, there is an opportunity for prizes. And uh, those particular prizes are awarded first at the state level. So there's a first place team in every grade in every state. And you remember what I was saying before about the mixed grade teams, they're going to be competing at whatever that highest grade level is. So um, that's why we have to pick a grade that they are competing in. So it's $1,000 per student for first place in the state, 500 per student uh, for second place in the state. Regional finalists then are the top three scores in each region in each grade. And every member of those teams will get $1,000 more. Uh, regional winners that we, we do our regional judging and the regional winners get uh, 2,000 each. And then at the national level, it's six thousand. Um, so up to ten thousand dollars that they could win, be competing in the uh, in the competition here. And uh, in addition to that, two thousand dollars that they are winning um, at the regional level, they would also get um, they would also be getting um, an all expense paid trip to DC to compete at the national level. Uh, but it's more than just winning. Uh, it really is about engaging the students and giving them a chance to do a project that is based on science and engineering. It's an opportunity for them to choose a topic that they want to explore. Um, so it's really the, the value that they get out of completing that project and completing that investigation or that engineering design process um, that is uh, probably the biggest benefit of the competition. So each year we have anywhere from 20 to 30,000 students register for eCyber Mission, and uh, we, we keep getting more and more each year. Uh, this is the, uh, I believe, the 20th year of the competition. Um, the chances of winning might be low, but like I said, the chance of learning something in the project are very high. Completing a project like this can help develop skills to conduct uh, complete and robust scientific investigations and engineering projects. It will also help students learn how to conduct research, work well in a group, um, and these are the types of skills that are sort of invaluable in high school and college and beyond. Also, they get to join a new community online, a community of other students in grades six through nine participating in eCyber Mission all across the country. And actually, even in other countries through our um, DOD schools that are located in other countries around the world.
They get to interact with them on the Eastside Mission website via our social media channels like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, so forth. Um, and getting to know these other students will help them form friendships in their community or friendships with people that they would otherwise never get a chance to know. Um, and don't forget, they're helping their community as they're working on all of this. And I apologize for the slides jumping forward. I'm not sure exactly why that's happening, uh, but my apologies on them moving forward before I'm moving forward. So Eastside Mission projects are different from kind of a typical science or engineering fair uh, because they're required to be community-based. So this means they students aren't just gonna choose a random topic. There's no volcano models or bridge building or anything like that. These Their projects for Eastside Mission need to be based on actual problems that they and others in their community are facing every day. So they need to look around them and see what kinds of problems are out there to be explored or solved. They can look in their classroom, their school, their town, their state, or maybe even their own home or backyard. So when it comes to choosing the type of project that they want to do, um, they can choose either an engineering project or a science project. And essentially the easiest way to tell the difference between this and what we explained to the students is if you're trying to solve a problem, then you're doing engineering. So you're gonna be designing and testing a prototype, but you're solving a problem versus science, which is all about answering a question. So developing and testing a hypothesis, but it's really, that's that's kind of the, the delineation there. We have solving a problem versus answering a question. And that's how we kind of explain the difference between science and, and engineering, if students ever have questions about that. Um, but either way, they're always working on a team as they are going through the, the process here. So like I said, the teams are three or four. Typically, this year we are allowing teams of two uh, due to the situation that we're in right now with the, with the pandemic. Um, so they're going to work together in a team. Uh, this is something scientists and engineers are doing all the time. And it's helpful because, you know, different people have different ideas. And also because they take something that could be a lot of work for one person and with two, three or four, it becomes much easier to get done. Uh, students can choose a team uh, with some friends, or maybe they find someone else that's not their friend, but shares an interest with them. And then it's also possible that you, as the team advisor, uh, because every team has a, a team advisor, all right? So that's the, that's the adult that is uh, kind of helping the team. Uh, it needs to be an adult that's affiliated with the team in some way. So most of our team advisors are teachers but we also have parent team advisors. We have community leaders that are team advisors. So as long as it's an adult over the age of 21, uh, they can be a team advisor. They can assign the teams um, themselves. So you can certainly do that. Or uh, like I said, you can have the students pick the teams themselves. Um, the teams need to have a name. So the students get to come up with that. Or again, you could assign that if you wanted to. Um, and there's also the opportunity for students to choose their login name as uh, they're coming up with their, their whole idea here. And we always encourage that login name not include any part of the student's actual first or last name, so it's not identifiable. Um, so here's a look at some of the past projects that have been done and that have actually won eCyber Mission national prizes. You can see that they're all very different subjects, uh, but what they have in common is that the team sort of completed the project thoroughly and explained each and everything that they did to the judges. So not all of the projects were actually successful, not all of the hypotheses were proven correct, but that's not what doing a science or engineering project is about. It's about following the process, even if it means it doesn't work and you know, learning from the failure that, that, that would result from that. But failure is not a bad word here. Failure is what scientists and engineers use to learn all the time. And this is a great opportunity for students to learn that lesson because oftentimes they're sort of trained to think of failure as being the end and being the worst possible outcome. Uh, but scientists and engineers don't see it that way. They see that as a way to know what to try in the future and what not to try. Um, so when it comes to choosing a topic, uh, that can sometimes be a difficult thing for students to do. So one of the things that we have them think about is what are they interested in, all right? Um, so we have them sort of ask the questions, what interests you? What problems do you see in your classroom or your town or school or so forth? 
have them try watching the news, reading the newspaper, asking friends and family what they see as problems. Um, and have them try to come up with uh, a lot of different ideas. So if they start exploring them and they find that some are too big to tackle or um, they don't have the resources to explore them, they can move on to something else. And if that seems overwhelming, uh, they can actually narrow them down with mission challenges. So the mission challenges are categories that we use to help the students narrow down and also to help them when they're seeking help from professionals. One of the great resources that we have through Cyber Mission is that we have access to Army scientists and engineers who volunteer their time to help these teams. So we use the mission challenges to then pair up the teams with the scientists or engineers who study in that particular field. Maybe one of these categories actually can help spark an idea that a team has they could use as the basis for their project. But either way, whatever they choose, whatever project they choose, they have to register. You, of course, have to register as well. In order to do that, you just go over to the website, ecybermission.com. That's also where all the additional information can be found on this. The registration link is right up in the top right. You, of course, would select Team Advisor if you were registering. If the students are completing their registration, uh, they're gonna select Student. And one thing for you to know is that step four of the registration for the students requires parent or guardian permission. So that is something that they would need to do. I mentioned before that they need a login name, but they don't need to know what topic they're going to explore before they register. That's not part of the registration. That's actually done uh, as a later step. So if they are working on, if they're, if they're interested in doing this, but they don't know exactly what they want to do yet, we do advise them to register. Uh, we advise you to register first though, because that way uh, one final step of their registration process is that they can actually link to you. And then when you log in, you'll see a list of all the students that have chosen you as their team advisor. And that's when you'll be able to then put them onto teams and um, sort of activate their mission folder. And the mission folder is their submission. That's what, that's what we call their submission. So this is the this is the kind of the the lead-in page to the mission folder. You can see that there are four parts to the mission folder here. There's the team collaboration, the in this case engineering design. Uh, if they did a science one, it would be um, scientific inquiry, uh, the community benefit, and the mission verification section. Um, this is the view that uh, you would have, and also the view that they would have. If so, if you chose a particular mission folder and clicked to look at it, you'd see this first. And then you could click edit on each of those sections to actually go in and see the questions. You would also actually be able to see the work that the students have done so far and put into the mission folder. Um, so you can kind of keep up to date on what they're working on, what they've done so far. Um, and one of the things that we have added this year, we've, we've kind of added uh, a couple of extra safety protocols. Um, and one of the things we have is a risk assessment form. You can see that in the resources list on the right side. And this is a, a thing that the students need to fill out with you um, once they know kind of what sort of tests they're going to do, what investigation they're going to do. We want them to go through and take a look at the potential risk that is there and then make sure that they have all the correct um, approval forms and uh, that they are mitigating any kind of uh, potential risk or danger that could that could come to the students uh, based on the type of investigation that they are conducting. So when you click on these different sections, you're going to see that they open up this particular one here uh, is the engineering design section and you can see that the questions are listed and then there's a place for the answers to be filled in. Um, so this is how the students actually submit their uh, their work is they're going to be putting their answers to these questions in here. Um, one of the things that uh, that doesn't happen with this is that these do not update in real time. So if two students were in a mission folder at the same time, and they were both working on different questions, and one clicked save and exited, and then another person clicked save and exited after that, they wouldn't see what the other person had written and the last person to click save, whatever they see, that's what's gonna be saved. So kind of all the other person's work might be lost. So what we've done is we have created some um, collaboration documents and you can see here in the resources section, uh, we have some Google docs that they can use where we have a template that they can download into their own Google drive and they can then use that to collaborate 
uh, and work in real time together, and then copy and paste the answers that they have worked on into their mission folder for the final submission. So um, that's a new thing this year as well to kind of help them work together and uh, to be able to collaborate. Because again, we know that a lot of students aren't able to meet each other face to face at this point. So we wanted to make sure that they could work um, collaboratively at the same time. Uh, so once all the sections are complete, the main mission folder page kind of looks like this. Um, I want to point out on this screen that you can also upload files to the mission folder. So this would be things like pictures, graphs, tables, so forth, any resources that the team wants to include in their mission folder uh, to help the judges better understand what they did. Um, but the students should always reference these files in their answers as well. So the judges know where to look for the attachments and what attachments they're looking for. Uh, they can do this at any time, though. It doesn't have to be the, the whole folder doesn't need to be complete before they can upload files. They can upload files at any time. Um, note the reminders down here at the bottom. Uh, you can see that the, the mission verification section asks questions about potentially hazardous biological agents, testing on vertebrates. And if they answered yes to any of these sections, it's going to remind them down there, hey, you need to have these particular permission forms or um, the, uh, the, the verification or excuse me, the approval forms. Um, and they, of course, should always attach the risk assessment form. So one of the things that you can use either when the students are completely done with the mission folder or they can use as they're going along are the rubrics. Um, so these rubrics are provided on the website and they are the exact rubrics that the judges will use when they are scoring the mission folders. So it's a really valuable resource because students can see kind of how they're doing. They can see what are the, the things that the judges are going to look for in each of these questions. How many points are each of these things going to be worth? And do they have that? So you can use these uh, to kind of grade individual sections if you want as the students are completing their mission folders. Or you can just you know point them out to the students and have the students review them themselves. So it's kind of up to you. But it's a great tool to use uh, as the students are, are completing it or when they're when they're completely done. So you can go back through and say, oh, all right, this is the type of score that we're going to look for uh, or probably see from the judges. Uh, so you and the team are going to make sure that everything is done and submitted by the submission deadline. Uh, I'll give you those, those exact dates in just a minute here. It's actually beginning of March this year that the, uh, the submissions need to be in. Um, but you can also choose to make different parts of the mission folder different, uh, you know, do at different times. So rather than making this a, okay, start working on this and have it done by March 1st, it can be type of a thing where you're like, okay, well, your problem statement needs to be done, you know, on this particular date. And then your, you know, your hypothesis needs to be written by this particular date, whatever it might be. Um, or you can have the teams establish those due dates for themselves and create their own calendar of when they are going to get different parts of the mission folder done. Uh, this is um, the, the checklist that is there for you as the team advisor. Uh, students have a checklist that looks very similar to this. It doesn't have the first couple of questions, but it does have the rest of this. So this is something that you would need to complete before in order essentially to submit the mission folder. And that again is would be your responsibility as the team advisor to submit each of the mission folders. We wanna make sure that the team advisor has had a chance to look at the mission folder before it's actually submitted. So uh, the students can't do that you actually have the opportunity to do that and submit it. Um, and you want to make sure that all of these things are checked off, that they've done each of these things. Um, and you also can unsubmit a mission folder if for some reason the team decided, oh, wait, you know, we thought we were done. We just realized something else. We need to change something. Until the submission deadline, you can actually unsubmit the mission folder and they can make their changes that they need to make. And then you would submit it again uh, after they've made those changes, but just make sure it gets resubmitted because if it's not resubmitted, it, it won't be uh, it won't be scored. So if the students would click on the submit mission button, they're going to see a note that explains their team advisor has to do it. Um, 
once a mission folder is submitted, it does be it is still available to read. So it is a read only type of thing. So if you go in and see a particular mission folder and it says read only next to it, that means it has been submitted. If it does not say read only next to it, then you want to make sure that you do submit it if it is done. So here's a little timeline, some important dates to keep in mind. Our registration opened in early August. It is open now. Um, our early registration deadline was November 11th. It actually just passed, but our registration deadline, our actual registration deadline is January 6th. So you've got plenty of time to still register teams and start having them working on these projects because the projects are going to be due March 3rd, 2021. So that's going to be the date that all the projects need to be submitted by. All right, so uh, that is uh, everything. I hope that you learned a little something about e -Cyber Mission if you didn't know it before. Um, I do see that some folks have asked some questions in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and answer those, but I'll also give you a chance to ask additional questions at this point. So let me uh, stop the share here and put on my camera. Hi, everybody. And let me take a look at the chat and see what we have here. Um, so, okay, great. So it looks like uh, we don't actually have a whole lot of questions, but uh, work really well with National Geographic Service Learning. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is a um, this this is a you know a service project, right? This is community based uh, problems they're looking at and helping their community. So that's that's what we're looking at here. Um, Thank you. I'm glad that you found this interesting. Uh, of course, if you do think of additional questions, if you don't have questions right now, but you think of some, you can head over to uh, ecybermission.com. Um, there's a link there uh, at the bottom. You can contact Mission Control. That's what we call uh, our helpline. And Mission Control is available um, basically from about nine to five on every weekday. And then, um, you know, so you could call them. Uh, or you can send them an email and you'll get a response within about uh, 24 business hours, um, I would say. So, you know, if you send it on a Friday at five, don't expect an answer right away, uh, but probably you'll see that answer on Monday. Um, but if you send us an answer or a question on Monday, you're probably going to get an answer Monday or Tuesday. So that's where that is at. Um, hey, Matt, does anybody do have, have any questions question? this morning? Can you hear me, Matt? Yes, I can. Crystal, go right ahead. Um, so I really like the setup of the website and registration was in August. Um, so my students were getting a late start, mm -hmm. but what about access to the website throughout the year? Is there something that you have that's available where students could work on projects and maybe um, submit multiple projects even, and then they could choose which one they submitted? Well, students cannot submit multiple projects. They only are allowed to have one submission per competition year. So they could work on multiple projects if they wanted to. I mean, you have access to the, the questions and things like that. So you could have them, you know, do as many projects as you want. And then the actual mission folder that they would complete would be the one that they were going to submit. Um, because, you know, you can, yeah, you can have access to the questions year round. Um, all of our resources are available at all times. Uh, so you don't even have to be registered in order to access the resources. So you can get to the questions, you can get to the rubrics, all that stuff right now. If you just okay. were to go to the site, click on resources, um, look under advisor resources or team resources, depending on what you're looking for. There's some video lessons, there's worksheets, there's all kinds of stuff to help them. Um, but yeah, you can access that at any time and a team can start working on a project April 1st of the previous year. Okay to submit for the next year. So teams could have started working on April 1st, anytime after April 1st, 2020, uh, they could have started working on a project to submit for this year. And then- Does that go into the planning part? Does that count? Um, sometimes at the end of the year, we're already discussing what we're gonna start that next year. So would we need to wait on planning for April 1st? Um, if you're talking about, well, when you say planning, like, can you give me give me an what example. What are you interested in? What 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 kind of project do you think? What what problems do you see? Just starting to talk about that initial thing for the, oh. the next com next coming school year. Yeah, I mean, talking about like the ideas of what they want to explore and things like that. That's absolutely something that can happen in advance of of April first. It's just there can't be any you know they can't be writing the answers to the questions. They can't be okay. um you know 
coming up with our hypothesis or testing it or things like that. Like essentially what we don't right. want is a project that somebody's working on for two years and submitting right. that against students who have only been working for, you know, six months, right? Um, now, obviously we do have teams that do projects that like they work on them for a couple of weeks and they submit them. And then there are teams that start work in April and then submit in March, you know what I mean? So it does, it is somewhat dependent, but we do like to have at least some kind of limit on it. So we just don't want somebody Absolutely. working on a project, yeah. you know, for years and years and then submitting it because obviously it's gonna be, you know, way, way better potentially. Uh, in that case. So. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. This is a good presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, we hope that you, you know, take part in, in the competition, folks. Um, if you find yourself, uh, I know that um, I, I work on another uh, AOP program called the Next Generation STEM Teaching Project. And so I work directly with a lot of teachers uh, and I am finding that this year in particular, teachers are a little overwhelmed. Um, who, who can guess why? Uh, but uh, if you find yourself right now looking at this competition thinking, gosh, this looks great, but I don't know if this is the year to do it. I don't know that I have the time. I don't know that my students have the bandwidth. I don't know that I have the bandwidth. If you're very interested in finding out more about it, one of the things that you can do is you can sign up to be a volunteer for the program as a virtual judge. And what you would do as a virtual judge is that in the month of March, we would assign you like 10 mission folders. We would give you that rubric and you would go through the mission folders and you would score them. Uh, this can be, this is obviously done virtually. So it's done, you know, anytime that you have time to work on it. Uh, we have like a three week period over which you have time to do it, but it gives you a chance to see the types of projects that are being submitted by teams from all over the country. But it, and it gives you a little, you know, a little peek inside eCyber Mission. So that's an opportunity. Uh, if you don't think you have the time to actually implement this year, take a look at that as something, take a look at our website, look at all the different you know, resources that we have available. Um, our website is actually going to change. Uh, we're getting a brand new website that's going to roll out um, for the next competition year. I'm not sure exactly when that's going to roll out, probably sometime in March or April, I would think. Uh, it's, but it's going to have all the same resources on it. It's just going to be like a lot fancier and uh, look a lot better on a mobile device. <laughs> Essentially, our website right now is old and uh, it doesn't have a very good mobile interface right now. So, but we're, we're fixing that. Um, and that's something to look forward to as well. So we're very excited about it. So um, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. If there are not, um, that's, that's pretty much all we've got for today. So um, feel free to, to head on over to another uh, workshop or take a look around the marketplace or just, you know, hopefully you're enjoying uh, the NSTA conference here and, um, have a great one. Your survey link, did you put one in? Oh, the survey link. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot. Thank you for reminding me, I appreciate that. There it is, the survey link is in the chat, folks. I apologize, Oof, I let people go before giving the survey link, tisk tisk. Thank you so much for the reminder, I really appreciate it. Um, so it's down there in the chat, you should be able to click on it and feel free to fill that out. Thank you.